emergency. This is an emergency. I've just walked in okay, and found my mother's body then. lying there. I'm completely dead. It was fairly obvious this was going to be a, a big story. We spent millions of pounds on this investigation, the most expensive investigations that Hampshire police have ever run. That type of thing doesn't happen around here. Why was this little old lady killed? This is a murder. Nestled beside the River Itchen sits the pretty hamlet of Brambridge. Brambridge is typical of these tiny little hamlets that have got very, very few homes there. Everyone really knows everyone. It's a very friendly kind of place, and you've got your little store, and all community life is, a, is around those, those areas. It attracts a lot of visitors simply because of the River Itchen. There were lovely walks along the river there. Again, one of the most beautiful you know, spots in England. Bambridge is most definitely one of one of the loveliest. This picturesque part of Hampshire often attracts a slower pace of life. It was always predominantly sort of an elder generation place, so people around here were sort of over 50s, 60s. The community is an aged community. It's, it's not an awful lot of very young people. There are some young people, of course, homes with kids and so on, but the majority of, of, uh, of the community is older people. The Hampshire Hogs, as they're known, they're very proud of their area. The local people who have been here for generations, and, yeah, like everywhere where it's village life, it, it's lovely. At the very edge of Brambridge lived a wealthy 77-year-old grandmother Georgina Edmonds. Everything that was said about Georgina Edmonds was just a lovely, lovely lady. Well-liked and loved by everyone that knew her, very close to her family, very friendly, and just a, a charming old lady. She had grandchildren that she really enjoyed playing with, was always up for a bit of a laugh. Um, her grandson was a budding filmmaker, and uh, he would make funny little videos at Christmas, and Georgina would star in those as well. And she enjoyed life, you know, she was still very independent, she was still mobile. She drove her car, she would go down to the shops, but she had assistance with that as well. Well, I knew her because one of the jobs I did at work was, you know, to take the groceries to the dear old souls who couldn't get around. I know she always had her little dogs with her, rather sweet little things. Very, very friendly. They used to stand up at the window and look out of the window. She was a, you know, a delightful person and nothing to say about her that wasn't nice. Georgina lived in a large gated estate on the edge of the river. The Edmonds family were well known in the area. It was Georgina's husband who had founded the family business, importing coffee. Very well-to-do family. Harry, uh, her son, worked in London. The business, I believe, was in Basingstoke. But again, most of the time, they were up in London working hard and would come back to Hampshire at weekends, um, you know, for, for, for rest. When Georgina's husband sadly passed away, she downsized into the smaller house on the estate. She moved into the, the cottage, which is a chocolate box cover cottage itself. Nice little house, you know, amongst the trees, by the river. Her son, Harry, uh, took over running the business and moved into uh, the, the larger house, as, as she would when you reach an older age. You don't want the bother of all the dusting. Georgina seemed happy in her new home. But in January 2008, life in the community changes forever. Police emergency. This is an emergency. I, I've just come down to my house. Um, my mother has a cottage a hundred yards away. Right. Um, I've got no reply from her. I've come in through her bedroom window, which was, was unlocked. She's lying on the floor in the kitchen, and it looks to me as if she's been hit. She's been hit over the head. She looks as if she's dead. OK, this calm down for me, sir. What's your name? My name is Harry Edmund. I'm her son. I've just walked in 
I, I came in through the window and I found the house in complete darkness. I've gone through into the kitchen okay, and found my mother's case, body then. lying there. And I've been out walking her dog. This looks like a crime scene to me. Okay, well try not to touch anything for me. Uh, this, is a, this is a murder. Okay, calm down, please, sir. Yeah, please, as soon as possible. I am think she's dead. That's a murder. It was about 6, 6.15. I was at home um, just prepping dinner, and my phone rang, and so I answered the phone, and they said, um, we've got a suspicious death. Um, I said, OK, tell me about that. And they said, oh, it's a... Uh, elderly woman um, being found dead in the kitchen, face down by her son. So I, I jumped in the car, and it was a miserable, wet, cold January night, uh, blowing a gale, uh, driving through these country roads as, as we are now. Paul Barton, Detective Chief Inspector at the time, arrives at Georgina's address which is already swarmed with a significant police presence. So just as I'm pulling down here, I can see the blue lights sort of flashing in, in the pitch black. So I know I'm getting close to it. And then I just come around the bend and there's some more police activity. A police van and a police car, an ambulance, and some tape here just across the bridge here. So I just pull in where I'm pulling in now, actually. I walked up the drive. It's a short walk up a gravel drive into the cottage. The kitchen door is on the side of the cottage. I just looked in. I could see, sadly, Georgina was lying there face down with a large amount of blood around her, some stab wounds to her neck. So I was satisfied at that point that we did have something uh, that was a suspicious death. A murder investigation is launched, and police maintain a secure perimeter in and around Georgina's home. You only get one go at recovering evidence from a body, and one that is already compromised. There will be a lot of discussion about what should be sampled at the scene, what should be done at the scene, what is going to be compromised by another action. So there will be a lot of effort going into preserving as much evidence as possible. I actually want this road completely closed. And it's one entrance in, one entrance out, but I didn't want anyone else coming across in. I certainly didn't want the press turning up and having a look. And so immediately, a, 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 what we call a wider cordon was put on, and, and we, we blocked the road so that we had complete control of the area. That morning, we went out for a walk, and we, as we crossed the road where it leads to her house, there was a policeman standing there. There was a car. The, the, the road was blocked. And I said, can you tell me what's happening on this road? There's been a murder. When the news broke, it was fairly obvious from the beginning that this was going to be a, a big story. Neighbours would phone the newsroom and say, can you tell us anything about what's going on? Everybody was talking about it, wherever you went, everybody in all the shops. And there were police everywhere, and you just wouldn't generally see police presence in that area. The 15 years that we've been here, we haven't seen or we haven't heard of a murder, except for this one. This is the first one. I think that was quite worrying, because, you know, why? Why was this little old lady killed? You know, what was the, what was the reason? So it, it just seemed very, very random and horrible. It became very obvious very quickly that this was uh, a murder hunt that was out of the ordinary, shall we say. So what led to a murder in this peaceful village? And why would someone want to kill a well-loved member of the community? Police emergency. This is an emergency. I've just walked okay. into the kitchen okay, and found my mother's case, body then. lying there. This looks like a crime scene to me. This is a murder. In the picturesque village of Brambridge, the close-knit community has woken up to the news that a much-loved 77-year-old grandmother, Georgina Edmonds, has been brutally murdered in her home. It's extremely grim. My mum was 77 at the time and living with us, you know, not very far away. So, yeah, you, you don't even want to think about it. 
it's gone from being a quiet village scenario to then being sort of on the local news, everybody talking about it, what's happened, you know, that type of thing doesn't happen around here. With a small community in fear of a killer in their midst, it's down to DCI Paul Barton to address the public. The Saturday morning I was doing my first media briefing and it was packed, you know, and it was Sky News Live, BBC Live. It was headline news, you know, it was Midsummer Murders, kind of 77-year-old lady murdered brutally. So the, the nation were interested and the media were interested. Under a national media spotlight, Hampshire police are under pressure to work out who would kill Georgina Edmonds and why. I just start sort of kicking into autopilot. The next thing I'm thinking is, well, who's done this? Who's responsible? Any suspicious incident calls in that area in, in, you know, in the last 24 hours? Has the victim been a, a victim of any other crimes? Uh, is there any sort of domestic violence within the household? What do we know about the rest of the family? What do we know about the neighbours? Was this a stranger murder? Was this someone, though, that she knew? And in such a small village, how did they get in and out of the cottage without being seen? With a killer on the loose, the finger of suspicion is on every member of the community. Everybody asking questions. We had so many people come in the pub at the time. You know, did you hear anything? Did you see anything? Do you know who it was? You know. We go out as the media and knock on doors and try to talk to people and find people that would have, would have known her. When you've only got five homes to actually knock on the door, the community, uh, they'll be in shock themselves, uh, actually, about it. With Georgina's son, Harry, too distraught to speak, it was left to neighbours to speculate what had happened. Had someone targeted her because of her wealth? They had a beautiful house, they had quite a bit of money in the family. And I just remember that, you know, the money, the big house, the jewellery, it was in a dark, secluded area. There was nothing else there. There was another house, I think, to the right, I, I seem to remember. But that's it. She was on her own. Police conduct a thorough search of Georgina's house for clues. We were exploring what could have happened. Was it burglary that there was the motive? Her credit card had been taken. I believe also a Radley handbag was gone. I think a laptop was, was gone. But there were other items that were there in the kitchen that were quite valuable. There was monies out, I believe, that were just left. And that, did, that seemed rather strange, that this was a burglary that had gone wrong, that the burglar hadn't taken those fairly obvious items that were there. Police take a closer look at the crime scene, and one significant thing jumps out. There's no sign of a forced entry. Was this a cover-up? Was it another motive? And so, therefore, had she been targeted in some other way, and, and it was a, you know, it was a pretend burglary taking just a few things, when a real burglar would have taken lots of things. With no sign of a break-in, everyone known to Georgina is under suspicion. Could the local community offer clues as to who Georgina may have let into the house? Trusting, you couldn't have had anyone more trusting. She was that sort of person. She never disputed things, you know, she just trusted people. And sometimes people are a bit suspicious, but she wasn't that type of person. She was the sort of person, and I guess this is of, of her age, that would keep her door unlocked. You know, she would talk to strangers. If someone knocked on the door and asked for directions, she wouldn't be suspicious. Probably even offer them a cup of tea and, you know, spend time with people. With no obvious break-in, detectives are left to speculate whether this was a random attack by a stranger or by someone closer to home. Quite often, the last person to see the person alive would be the killer. It is odd that a son comes home and finds their mum dead in a kitchen. I've dealt with other jobs where children have killed parents. You know, they may have been off their face on drink or drugs. Uh, there may have been a domestic argument that's then gone too far. He could have had an axe to grind with his mother, and he could have killed his mother, and then he's just made up that he's come in and found her dead. 
Police reanalyzed the 999 call made by Georgina's son, Harry. I've just walked in okay, and found my mother's body it. lying there. This looks like a crime scene to me. This is, a, this is a murder. It's a strange call, I have to say. He's very calm, but he says she's dead. I think it's a murder, he says. And I remember, you know, we played that time and time again, and it's gone out in the media as well. And, you know, a lot of people thought that was strange. Police bring Harry in for questioning to establish his movements in the hours his mother was murdered. He tells detectives he was at work all day and did not return home till 6 p.m. He was concerned because he hadn't heard from his mother all day, and I think he'd been trying to call her. And he went to the cottage, and it was in darkness. Harry has managed to force open the ground floor window, I think, into Georgina's bedroom. He climbs in, goes into the kitchen, and finds Georgina lifeless on the floor in a pool of blood. Harry's story is quickly verified. Police are still no closer to establishing who had gained access to Georgina's home. So they release CCTV footage of Georgina the day before her death, which shows her holding a handbag, which is now missing, and urge the public for help. To be honest, most people were pretty appalled anyway, just the fact that an old lady had been murdered without knowing the detail. And generally, everyone was trying to be as helpful as they possibly could. Well, it was a huge community thing, and they had big things in the village hall. So everyone got together, they all went out searching. Everybody was sort of part of it. Everybody searched, everyone went and looked, and, yeah, all together, really, as a community. Despite the community's best efforts, Georgina's handbag isn't found. But post-mortem results help police identify the cause of death. Could this lead to clues as to her attacker? On one level, the death of Georgina Edmonds pathologically is straightforward. She has been struck on the head with a heavy blunt object. Ultimately, it was identified that that was a marble rolling pin. A heavy weapon, a good sort of thing to use to cause damage. But on top of that, you then have the incised wounds, the cuts to the body, inflicted with a degree of deliberation and you don't really have defensive type injuries. One conclusion that could reasonably be drawn is that if they're not in a place where they are likely to kill you, that they are an act of torture. There is an attempt to distress somebody and extract information. Police now believe Georgina was tortured before she died. It was horrific. Terrible. And as more details came out about what the guy had done to her, apparently tortured her, I mean, it got, it got worse and worse. Eventually, it emerged just the, the horrible scale of the injuries to Georgina that were allied to trying to find out her PIN number for her credit card. We established about five hours after discovering her body that somebody had attempted to use that cash point card at a local ATM. And we feel that they were trying to get the PIN number out of Georgina. Police trace CCTV from that local Tesco ATM in nearby East Lee, only half a mile away from the murder scene, and see someone attempting to take money out. They attempted to use the machine a couple of times, I think it swallowed up the card and off it went. So we didn't have a facial image of the person using the ATM machine, but we were confident to say it was a man. And in particular, the user of the ATM machine was wearing a thick fluorescent jacket with a hood up. And the person that approached that clearly knew that that camera was there because they, they took all you know, reasonable steps to, to avoid being seen, keeping their head down, keeping the hood up, etc. Despite his face being hidden, Detectives now have an image of Georgina's killer, and the search for this person intensifies. This is probably someone who was local or had local connections with, with Eastleigh. Have we had any offenders that have been released from prison recently in that area on licence? Have we got any registered sex offenders or violent offenders that are in that area? Luckily for me, the duty detective sergeant happened to know 
that there was a, um, a bail hostel called Elderfield House, which was pretty much at the end of the road from Brambridge leading into Otterbourne Village. It's the sort of place that you wouldn't expect to find in a, an affluent village like Otterbourne or, or Brambridge, and there are some unpleasant people there. Behind those trees is, is Elderfield. You can just see the rooftop over yeah. there. These are people that had done time in prison, and uh, after their term was over, they have sent them here. It's a halfway house, basically. It's a halfway house. It was okay. somewhere where they could sort of spend time and sort of rehabilitate and get back into yeah. normal life. And they would hang around in groups and get very drunk. And it was, yeah, it was not nice. It was quite un a bit unsettling. It is of, of some concern in, in that you don't know what's going to happen next. You would often get some of them escape or they would then get out and they aren't supposed to be out. Danger, I guess, it was described as. Police question the residents of Elderfield to establish their movements on the night of Georgina's murder. There were four people that were unaccounted for that night. I think three had come back late. Within 24 hours or so, we declared four people as suspects from Elderfield House. And we arrested them, searched their rooms, brought them back to the police station, forensically examined them, and then put them through the interview process. After hours of questioning, it soon becomes clear to detectives that three of the suspects had clear alibis and are released without charge. But the fourth did not return to Elderfield for 24 hours during the night Georgina was murdered. And his clothing is of particular interest to police. CCTV showed this fluorescent jacket, which was really key. And in our search in Elderfield House, we established that one of the residents um, who was unaccounted for on the night was wearing a big fluorescent jacket. He had previous convictions for murder or manslaughter. And so he was of particular interest and excitement to the team at that time. But police are able to verify the fourth man's alibi, and he is released without charge. And with no suspect or clear motive, fear begins to escalate across the local community. It's unsettling. It's unknown because the police don't tell you exactly what's, what's happening, especially when they say, well, we haven't found him yet. We're still looking out for him. We, da, da, da. So where is he? It was quite scary. My family were saying to me, don't go out on your own at night. Don't go out to the car park on your own. It definitely makes you change the way you behave, um, the way you think. For ages, people didn't go to the garden centre. That was really affected by the whole situation, because I just think people thought it was a, a dangerous area to go to, so they didn't go there. They were getting more and more concerned and worried that the, what, is, this is someone still here, then, is it? Are we to believe that this is a, a stranger of someone that was passing through, just happened to pick the cottage, just happened to realize that, find that the door was open, going there, carry out this terrible crime, and then just drive away and leave the area utterly and completely, and that's it? Or is it more likely that the perpetrator is still here amongst us? It's been one month since much-loved grandma, Georgina Edmonds, was found murdered in her home in Brambridge, and police are yet to charge anyone for the heinous crime. It, it was in the media daily, you know. Was, you, any newspaper stack, you saw it. It was on the news, it was on the radio. We had boards up everywhere, and if you lived in the area as well, you, you couldn't miss it. Everyone knew what was going on. I think at the time there was an urgency to get this one done, to get it sorted. The only sighting detectives have is by a Tesco ATM machine in nearby East Lee. And so the investigation to find this man spotted on CCTV escalates. We knew that Georgina's uh, card had been attempted to be used. Then obviously that, for me, becomes an area of concentration for house to house. So we had police patrols in the area, certainly at the Tesco Express. 
we wanted to capture anyone that was there at the material time. So we uh, obviously pulled the CCTV from the, the petrol station itself. We could read all the registration numbers of the cars coming in. And then we had the obvious houses sort of adjacent to Tesco Express and then right opposite. And so we, I decided that we would focus house to house in that area as well, knocking on doors. Again, good old fashioned detective work. And it isn't long before one address catches police attention. There was a raid on a, on a house that wasn't far from where the, the cash point had been, where the person in the frame had been using the debit card. There was a particular address not a million miles away from the ATM machine where a man lived up until the point of around about the 11th of January and then disappeared. The inquiries that we did identified that he was Polish and had gone back to Poland and he may have also had some previous convictions, so I sent the team out to Poland. Suddenly, the new story goes international. We had reports that the, the police had actually gone out to Poland to carry out inquiries. There was a lot of media interest in, in this particular case, and then the media were descending on us, and, and they would put two and two together and come up with murder, fled to Poland and all this. You know, got the community kind of excited, if you like, because they were thinking, oh, great, they finally caught that person. Police question the Polish man regarding his movements on the night Georgina was murdered. Have they finally found their killer? He was alibied, and also, I think, through DNA as well, we were able to eliminate him from the inquiry. With the Polish man in the clear, Hampshire police are back in the UK and back to square one. So they release a clearer version of the CCTV footage to the public and suspect the person is a male aged between 16 and 60 with an estimated height of 5 foot 11. The hunt for this man accelerates to new levels. We wanted DNA swaps from males matching that description to come forward. Our view was, if you've got nothing to hide, come forward. You can't force people to, to do that kind of thing. But what this did, of course, was to add to the suspicion in the community. But I would have come forward because feeling, well, if I don't, then suspicion's going to fall on me. I must admit that, in my experience, I've never come across a mass DNA appeal uh, anywhere that I've worked before. It was certainly turning into something that's, um, well, a modern-day thriller. More than 2,000 local men have their DNA swabbed, but there are no immediate results, and the case goes cold. Two and a half years later, and Georgina's killer is still at large. But on the 30th of June, 2010, things take a dramatic turn. An arrest is made. And it's a local man. 31-year-old Matthew Hamlin. We scramble to find out who this man is. He's got a history of violence, and, you know, he's not, he's not a nice guy to know. Matthew Hamlin was known to police. He'd been known for drug usage and also violence in the past. He had an off-on relationship with a, with a local girl. In fact, he'd had a, an argument with her and resulted hitting her with an ironing board, and she moved out of the, the home. He had quite a bad drug habit at that time, using cocaine. And we understand he also racked up numerous debts as a result of his drug usage. And so that kind of fitted the profile of somebody high on drugs, desperate, and probably not really thinking what they're doing. You can understand that the police would be interested in him. He used to walk his dog along the riverbank there and would know the area quite well. So he fitted in one of the profiles, shall we say, for the police. But what exactly led to Matthew's arrest? One particularly interesting subject came to them with a, with a couple of, of bits of evidence. The first was that despite he denying that he had been in the, the area on that particular day and time, uh, his phone records were showing that he actually was there. This person had a mobile phone, and what we could show was that their phone was um, bouncing off the, the same cell mask on the afternoon of the 11th of January. 
With Hamlin in custody, police waste no time in recording his every word when his mum visits. The other thing is I might have an alibi for it as well. What do you mean? When they first interviewed me, I had, um, I, was, I got a clue where I was. And Sarah got out of her diary and she flipped through, looked at the date and she said, um, yeah, you was with me. I can speak to Sarah. Yeah. See if she's still going to make that. I think she was trying to be helpful for him. And I guess, you know, if you think about it, you don't want to think your child is responsible for doing such a, such a grave crime. And so I, I would imagine she was desperate. I haven't spoken to them for ages. I haven't fallen out of them, but I haven't spoken to them. I suppose she's still going to say that or not. But I can't really remember it. I was off my head all the time. I was drunk. I don't know what I was doing. I don't know where I was two and a half years ago. I struggled where I was last week. It was quite clear in that recording that he was trying to manufacture an alibi at that time that would take him out of the area at the material time when Georgina was murdered. As well as Hamlin's mobile phone pinging on a nearby mast, linking him to the scene, new evidence comes to light, which police believe is even more conclusive. The other bit was partial DNA that was found on the rolling pin, and also, I believe, on a small part of, of, of her clothing. That was a partial match to this particular subject, putting the two together, and he came right to the top. Eventually, the scientists were able to show some components of that mixed profile were 2,600 times more likely to be attributable to Matthew Hamlin. We were fairly confident that Hamlin was responsible. After a manhunt that lasted years, it seems police have finally found their man. And Matthew Hamlin is charged with Georgina's murder. Matthew pleads not guilty, and 10 months later, the trial begins at Winchester Crown Court. You're nervous, you're excited, you've got the victim's family up in the gallery. Your QC opens up the case, you hear what's being said, and you sit back and think, that sounds pretty good. You know, if I'm on the jury, I'd be thinking, guilty. The prosecution lay out a mountain of evidence against Matthew Hamlin. And after a three-month trial, the jury returns with its verdict. When the call came through, I remember the, the, the news desk saying to me, it's not guilty. At that moment, it was one of those moments in the newsroom where you get that stunned silence. They don't happen that often. So when they do, and when it's such an important case like that, you can't really describe it. It's just a punch in the guts. You know, yes, professionally, you're disappointed for yourself, you know, and your team, but it's the family, you know, you really feel for. And, you know, you, you do question, you, you do question, could we have done more, you know? Did we have the wrong person, you know? Is there somebody out there that's, that's done this that we haven't caught? I do think about the community, but the community had lived with this for four years. They believed that the monster amongst them had been caught and was now going to get their, his just desserts. And now it wasn't. And according to the court, he's not the monster at all. Well, who is the monster? Despite a two and a half year manhunt and becoming Hampshire Constabulary's most expansive investigation, Matthew Hamlin has been acquitted of Georgina Edmonds' murder. Leaving her family the community and the police feeling devastated and in shock. Well, we're back now to square one. The mystery continues. The courts have cleared him. So who is it? Is it my neighbor? Is it my friend? Is it someone in my family? Is it someone I work with? You always have to be open-minded and you have to accept that actually Hamlin didn't do it. There is someone else out there. With the case unsolved, the possibility of the killer getting away with murder looms over police. Are the police looking for anyone else? Is the case closed? And the, the police were quite adamant that the case remained open, that they were carrying on their investigations. 
So obviously we have a debrief. Uh, we'll meet with council as well. We'll speak with the family. We will conduct a review of that investigation to see if there are any, anything we missed, anything we could have done, mainly because so lessons can be learned because once somebody's been acquitted, that's it. Detectives go back to the drawing board and relook at all the evidence they have collated over the years and examine what went wrong. We spent millions of pounds on this investigation, the most expensive investigations that Hampshire police have ever run, and the forensic budget was through the roof. Beforehand, they had looked for his DNA on the marble rolling pin, but graphically, there was so much of Georgina Edmonds' blood on that 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 blurred everything, and they got just a partial sample. And then from an, another small part of her clothing, where, again, it was a partial sample, I mean, you're asking a jury to put someone away for life on the grounds of circumstantial evidence and also partial DNA. It's too cloudy, and I think juries can then look at it and say, can I actually send a man away for life on evidence here which is not the strongest? Police spend years looking for new techniques to forensically identify a killer. And they eventually come across a recent form of DNA testing called YSTR, which extracts the male DNA profile from a full DNA profile. It's a simple process, and it's almost sellotape, on uh, clothing and points of the body to remove skin, skin cells. So it's fairly early on in the, in the exhibits that we are taking of the left sleeve of Georgina's blouse, which would have had skin cells on there. And so the decision was taken to look at those skin cells and examine them, because we hadn't done so far. We'd done the, the waistband, but not, not the sleeve. And then obviously it went for analysis, um, number crunching, et cetera. And it came back with a, uh, a full male profile On Thursday, 30th of October, 2014, police make an announcement. They have arrested and charged a suspect for the murder of Georgina Edmonds. As a new trial looms, people want to know who is in the frame. None other than Matthew Hamlin. This is incredible. They're going to put him back on trial. It wouldn't have been allowed because Double jeopardy meant you could not be tried for the same crime in this country. That had only been changed a few years prior to that, which enabled this to actually happen. Despite the double jeopardy rules changing in 2003 and a new stack of DNA evidence, how did detectives manage to get Hamlin's charge over the line? It's not an easy thing to do for obvious reasons. The defence argued that it, it's not new evidence, you had it all along, you just chose not to examine it and find it. But actually, it's not evidence until you've actually turned it into evidence. And that was the, the ruling of um, Sir Brian Leveson, who, who heard that at the Court of Appeal, who then quashed the acquittal, and we were able to then go for a retrial. January 2016, exactly eight years after Georgina's murder, the second trial of Matthew Hamlin begins at Winchester Crown Court. The prosecution lay out all their evidence once again, including their new secret weapon, the YSTR DNA technique. We we're hoping for a better outcome this time. It's one in 26 million, that DNA, that it's not him. And when you describe that, you know, there's 26 million to one is this person, I think it was a fairly easy decision uh, for the jury to make. Layered on top of that was obviously he was a local person, violent background, and obviously the phone was, was bouncing off the mast at the time. Despite presenting their new evidence in court, there are many in the community who are unconvinced that Matthew Hamlin is the killer. At the time of the second trial, Matthew was a changed man leaving behind his days of drug taking, working full time as an electrician and raising his family. And after a gruelling six week trial, the jury retires to consider the verdict. 
when you do get to court and the prosecution and the defence have had their say and the judge has summed up, you still get a bit nervous, even though you, you just know in your heart of hearts that it's a really, really strong case. So we can't speculate, we can't talk to people um, about, well, you know, what do you think this time? Do you think he's going to get off a second time? On the 23rd of February, 2016, the jury returned with a verdict. Eight years after Georgina Edmonds, aged 77 years, was found dead at her home in Bambridge, Matthew Hamlin has today been found guilty of her brutal murder. It was just a sense of relief and just great work. And, and so many people, bear in mind this investigation had gone on for years really, and uh, so many people have got involved in that investigation. But it was just such a nice feeling. Throughout this entire investigation, we have been absolutely determined to prove beyond reasonable doubt who committed this horrific crime. After the discovery of new evidence and presenting it to the Court of Appeal, we were able to try Matthew Hamlin again for the murder of Georgina Edmonds. The whole prosecution team were determined to find justice for Georgina, and today that has been achieved. Being stood there listening to Harry address the media and just say some really nice words about me and my colleagues and Hampshire Police and all the work that we've done to get, get justice for, for, for the family. So, yeah, just just a great feeling. The entire team of police officers, police staff, prosecution barristers, forensic scientists and colleagues from the Crown Prosecution Service have been absolutely dedicated to putting together the best possible case that could be put before the court and the jury. Every moment has been worth it to see justice finally served and the killer of Georgina Edmonds behind bars. Thank you. With Matthew Hamlin finally behind bars, the question that still puzzles the community is why would he want to end the life of Georgina Edmonds so brutally, torturing her before battering her to death? Who can say, and it's difficult for me to speculate. Well, we know now from the, um, from the court case, although he's never admitted it, that he was short of money, that he had walked along the riverbank and he had found his way into in the cottage, whether that was just by pure chance, whether he had seen her walking her dogs and had known that she was gone there and she was a vulnerable old lady. Sadly, whether he would have known or not that the door was left open when he went in, he had tortured her to reveal the number for her debit card by stabbing her something like 27 times and then just leave her there, tie her up or something like that. But then it all got, who knows? Who knows what it is? But I think what we can doubt tell is that he is a pretty evil, nasty guy who will spend 30 years in prison. And after eight long years of fear, can normal life return for the local community? It's so close to, to, to reality for us here that, you know, it, it's, it's traumatic for all of us for, in, in the village. They're vulnerable too, they're so trusting. I know we all felt very, very sorry for her, yeah, very sorry. A journey into a hidden world. Can you break the walls of silence? New Murder in Amish Country is Friday at 9 on Sky Crime. <laughs>